morning, everybody. I'd like to call to order the Pierce County or Pierce County Performance Audit Committee meeting for March 22nd, 2023. The time is 10.05 a.m. Clerk, will you please call the roll? Thank you. Council Member Kruber. Here. Council Member Hitchin. Here. Council or Dick Murray, sorry. Uh, excused. Gary Robinson. Excused. Josh Smith. Present. And Council Member Campbell. Here. We have four members present. All right. Well, uh, with four members present, we do have a quorum. Um, approval of the agenda. Looks like we have uh, about four things that we're going to discuss pretty quickly here. Um, the uh, any changes or corrections to the agenda, um, Mr. Vetter. Uh, we have someone here to present on item number eight. Is that correct? That's going to just be a staff presentation. Okay. Um, do we have anyone visiting to report on w which item? Yes, uh, number eight, uh, Deputy Chief uh, Unfred from Lakewood Police Department is here to, if you'd like to call on him. Uh, I'm, I'm going to ask if we move that to be the first after we do the minutes that way, uh, uh, respect his time and thank you for coming out. But uh, you don't need to listen to us talk about our <laughs> in, internal work. Uh, so uh, just moving, we'll just uh, be doing item number eight as item number five. The rest will be adjusted. Uh, next up, we have approval of the minutes. We have the meeting minutes of the regular meeting of October 26, 2022, special meeting of December 14th, 2022, and the special meeting of January 25th, 2023. Any changes, corrections, or updates? Well prepared, as always. Thank you. Uh, seeing no changes or corrections or updates, I will go ahead and consider the meeting minutes to be approved. And with that, we will move to... Uh, what is not item number eight on our agendas? Pierce County High Speed Vehicle Pursuit Study Report with updated data. Uh, Mr. Vetter. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And before I hand it to uh, Nathan Schumer to go through some of the data, I just wanted to remind the committee that the council and committee requested that we provide some new charts um, based on the last presentation uh, to include a few different metrics. Um, and we also have updated data from the Lakewood Police Department. Um, at the end of your packet, the very end, I've included the original presentation tables um, so that you can see what has changed. Uh, so with that, I'll hand it over to Mr. Schumer. Um, next slide, please. Uh, so briefly, um, what we're looking at here is um, uh, some updated and corrected data from the Lakewood Police Department on their pursuits. Um, a summary of the causes of pursuit initiation for the Pierce County Sheriff's Department, uh, and then also a highest charge analysis for pursuits um, that results in arrests for the Pierce County Sheriff's Department. Could you turn the mic a little oh, bit sorry. more towards you to make sure? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, yeah, uh, and my plan is to pause after doing the Lakewood updates um, uh, to see if there are any questions or comments there, or uh, to some space for uh, Chief Unfred. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so, with Lakewood, we added um, we added about 70 more pursuits um, for the pre-HP 1054 data. Um, so uh, this is uh, definitely a result of like, I'm kind of working closely with Chief Unfred to be precise about pursuits uh, and which pursuits were carried out by Lakewood, uh, and kind of correcting the, uh, the record there. Um, so the new total pursuits um, is 128. Uh, the pursuits that led to the arrest of the driver. Um, we used uh, slightly different categories um, following Lakewood here. Uh, so about 49.21 or 63 um, resulted in arrests. 49.21% uh, resulted in arrests. 7.03% uh, uh, led to arrests with follow-ups. 12.50, uh, um, their suspect info, no arrest uh, at this time. And then 31.25% were terminated. Um, the accident rate for Lakewood is 25.98. Uh, and the injury rate is 6.29, and then the fatality rate um, in this time period is 0%. Um, um, so, and then next slide, please. And so we also did some corrections here as well. Uh, so these are pursuits after HP 1054, uh, and 
you know, working closely to distinguish, uh, Lakewood distinguishes pursuits from eludes. Um, so we had, in, we had put these all together as one before. Um, so in terms of their pursuits, um, they did 30 pursuits after 1054, uh, really starting at the end of July 2021. I, I think I'm telling that. No, starting in July 2021. Um, in terms of eludes, um, they recorded 314 eludes. Um, eludes are people uh, 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 fleeing from, you know, failing to yield or fleeing from the police. Um, their arrest rate uh, for pursuits uh, in, in the post-1054 period was 73.33%, uh, uh, 22 total pursuits. Uh, the accident rate was 43.33, 13, uh, 13 total. Uh, the injury rate was 23.33, 7. Um, and the fatality rate was uh, 0%, and there is one fatality associated with a pursuit, but it's um, occurred after the pursuit was terminated. It's sort of a... Uh, as, as you read the report, and uh, Chief Officer can kind of go into this uh, if he wants. Uh, it's it's kind of a strange situation. Uh, so, yeah, um, that's sort of how we how we kind of updated and directed the data. Yes. 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 Uh, so first of all, I want to really thank Nathan uh, for working with me on this data. And if you'll identify yourself for the record, and let me get your mic turned on over there. Yeah. All right, go ahead and it should right. be on. Thank you. Uh, Assistant Chief John Unfred of the Lakewood Police Department. Um, I want to start by thanking uh, the work that Nathan did on this. Uh, when I first, you know, uh, spotted some discrepancies, um, you know, I was expecting maybe some more uh, ego in front of that, but he um, has been completely... Um, cooperative and we have really worked uh, together to get to really good clean data which is my next point is that uh, good data is really important hold, hold up one more second I think we got the mic backwards the little table one there okay is that better try, try that I think so yes much better I'm getting the message from the back that okay the, we can hear you much better now. all right we try to speak lower in here uh, so good data is important for good policy I think we all realize that uh, and that's why Lakewood specifically collected this data on the eluding. Um, and we require our officers to actually write a report every time this happens. Uh, it's a very short report, obviously. It's just vehicle took, takes off and a, and a description. But it builds that data set uh, that we could, because we knew that once this uh, House Bill 1054 took effect, that it was going to have an impact. And so we wanted to measure that impact. Um, there's lots of data being could, thrown around. Could you Describe for me the difference between elude and pursuit and yeah, what, that's, what that means. Sure, that's that's a good point. Um, so we define an elude as where uh, the suspect refuses to stop and the officer does not or cannot pursue them. So the officer turns on the lights, and this is a little bit of a challenge because there's that certain period of when the officer turns on the lights to pull someone over, and are they you know, thinking about it, or are they finding a safe place, or are they going to take off? But when they actually take off under the new law, you know, we can't pursue them um, except under limited circumstances. So eluding is when they, they take off and the officer doesn't pursue them. A pursuit is when the officer has the authority and is actively engaged in chasing or pursuing that vehicle. Um, so that's sort of our differentiation in that. Um, and so on the eluding, we have our officers, as I mentioned, uh, write a report and document that. And so that has built that data set, uh, which we felt was important because uh, we wanted to have that data to further this discussion uh, down the road. As I mentioned, there's lots of data being thrown around right now around uh, pursuits and eluding. There's obviously an active bill in the legislature right now. There's a lot of uh, discourse uh, taking place on that. And it's really important, as you know, uh, to get good, clean data. Uh, the devil's in the details. And you can see you know, how we broke those out just in terms of the arrests and uh, even the, the fatality. So for us, that one fatality was at the end of a pursuit, a homeowner, it's a very strange situation, the homeowner came outside with a shotgun because he'd heard all the, the sirens and was standing on his property in front of his house. The suspect then purposely drove the vehicle into him, pushing him into the house and killing him. So you have a pursuit, but that act is actually a vehicular homicide um, in, with the, because it was with the intent to kill the homeowner. So um, we don't consider that a pursuit-related 
fatality, that's sort of a separate act. So that's kind of where you get into uh, with some of the data. So we really have to clean and verify our data and then use that impartially uh, when we're talking about policy. Um, I'm really looking forward to this uh, audit review coming out, and I'm pushing and hoping that more law enforcement agencies collect uh, this data because I think this is going to be an ongoing discussion over the next couple of years, and the best way to get to good policy is to have good, clean data, and so that's, that's our goal. I understand that our data is just a small part of you know, this review, um, but it is an important comparison. And so, I, again, I really appreciate uh, Nathan and I spent a lot of time on the phone and email back and forth, spreadsheets and uh, geeking out on our data. But uh, I think we got to some really good, clean numbers um, that I am confident in standing behind. So thank you. Oh, Do you have any questions? I'm sure we may have a few questions. I'll look to my council members first to give me a nod or a wave. Council Member Hitchin. Thank you, Chair. Um, thank you very much for um, working with us to make sure that we do have the correct and, and also acknowledging and thanking you for collecting the data because I know when we went out to other jurisdictions because we this was so top of mind, we really wanted something to compare our deputies and our Sheriff's Department data to because we wanted to see if what we were hearing and seeing was playing out. And to do that in a standalone way is very challenging. So I'm hoping in years to come we'll have other law enforcement agencies that are willing to dialogue because we know that the goal is community safety and we use the data to inform policies. And when you see policies that are promoting both officer safety and community safety and helping with the public safety side of it, so arrests and getting people that are not doing what they're supposed to do off the, off the streets, we now have data to support those policies, and when we have areas where it's not working, we now have data where you can go, hey, look at what they're doing over here. And I, and that really is the end goal here, is really to look at what's working and what's not working to make it better. So just truly appreciate Lakewood collecting this data and being willing to share it with us um, and, and allowing us to work together to, to be able to display it so we can continue this conversation. So thank you to your team and, and everybody that worked together to make it. Thanks. Thank Absolutely. you, Chair. Thank you. Uh, Committee member Kruber. Thank you, Chair. Thank you for taking the tedious time to go through the, the data. And I'm wondering, was there any data that surprised you that came across on this? Not really. Um, I think when I first saw it, that's what drew me to it, because when I first saw the performance review, I knew just off the top of my head, like the number of pursuits seemed low, um, and that's why I took another look at it. Uh, you know, anecdotally, uh, we do shift recaps. Every sergeant at the end of the shift does an email on any significant events. And so we were seeing the eludes, but again, I didn't have numbers. And so um, pulling the numbers, uh, that's a lot. And But, the, you know, 22 a month, that is about what I was seeing. It's, you know, at least almost daily. So uh, in that, I wasn't uh, surprised, no. <clears throat> but by any chance on the illusion, the illusions, eludings, did... Um, did you know who the person was, or were they just somebody who's like, oh, I can't get caught now, or someone who you had a record on, and they are continual um, lawbreakers? And that's the challenge, is that you know a huge percentage of those are unknown suspects, um, either because the officer's just behind them and they take off, so we have no idea who is the driver. Um, a lot of them are stolen vehicles, and mm -hmm. so obviously the registered owner has no connection to the driver at that point. Um, there are some cases where we have a crime and then they might take off and we might, you know, through investigation, identify who the driver likely was. Um, there is, uh, I know, one theory that, well, you know, law enforcement can just arrest people after the fact. And we actually have a, a chart where we show that um, out of the eludes, we arrest maybe two or three a month. Um, because it's very difficult because uh, you have to prove that a specific person at that specific time was driving that vehicle. Mm -hmm. uh, and if all you get is kind of a blur, you know, shot of a person driving in a car at high speed, that's next to impossible. Yeah, especially if they're wearing a hoodie or something. Right, right. So, okay. And was there any data not collected that you would like to see collected that would be uh, beneficial to your work? Um. I don't think so. I think this is a is a pretty good start. Um, one area probably is the the vehicle rammings, um, and again, we'd need to put some parameters around that. But we've seen, and some of that is law enforcement adjusting our tactics. And so, when we do, the suspect does stop, or if they're 
already stopped and we contact them, because so many have taken off, we now start uh, pinning the vehicle if we can. So putting a patrol car in the front and rear um, to prevent them from fleeing, because we know if they flee, we can't chase them. Um, and then there's other cases where just during an elude or a pursuit, they ram, you know, either a patrol car or a citizen. So, um, and that's a little bit difficult to kind of tease out of the data set, um, you know, with the ramming. But that would be something that, you know, if I had the time and resources to pull that out, uh, because we are seeing more and more of that. So you're finding that the lawbreakers are more bold because they know what the laws are. Yeah, absolutely. Not. I mean, we've seen cases where they literally just ram back and forth and, and get out uh, and then take off. And they know that you know, we're not going to chase them. We can't mm -hmm. uh, because of the, the law. And there's no kind is it no, is there a way to get a data set on those who elude and then commit more crimes and more, more havoc? I think that would be challenging uh, just because we don't know who yeah. is eluding and identifying those. That I'd ask. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Thank you for your work. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, checking on the line to see if there's any questions. Um, I got a few, and I wasn't here in December when we got this first one, so I got to unpack the data just a little bit more. So I, I hope you'll bear with me. And um, so defining a pursuit is, is a pursuit where you, like, actively pursue them for several blocks, and, but that doesn't indicate whether or not you terminate the pursuit or if it's a successful pursuit. Yeah, and that becomes a, you know, uh, a little bit of a problem too. And um, it's actively chasing or pursuing them. But as I mentioned, you know, it initiates with the officer turns on their lights um, for, for a traffic stop, and then there's that period where you know it's reasonable for a person to find a safe place to pull over and so on and. Um, and there's indicators, right, of if they slow down or follow the speed limit. Obviously, if they take off, then it's pretty clear. If the officer has the lawful authority to pursue, at that point, when they realize that they're not pulling over, then I would designate that a pursuit. Um, and then, and that's the, the difference then between an eluding is the, the lawful authority there. Okay. Um, when we look at the accident rate and up there it's at 43 percent did if you guys perform a pit maneuver on someone is that going to be considered an accident rate or is it an accident when uh an uninvolved uh vehicle house tree whatever gets involved right and that's another uh good point uh, we don't consider a pit a collision or an accident that's an intentional technique that we're using to, you know, spin the car out, pursuit interdiction technique. Um, and so we don't count, even though there is contact and, you know, may look like an accident um, between two vehicles, but that's an intentional maneuver. So we don't count those as accidents. Um, accidents are just separate collisions. She's asking what a pit is. So, Yeah, so the pursuit interdiction technique um, pit and that's basically where the patrol car comes up and makes contact with the rear of the suspect vehicle on the side, the rear fender, uh, and then drives into it and it spins the okay. suspect vehicle around. And then, and the tactic then has always been to pin it. And so that's kind of where we've gotten this idea now of pinning before that even happens. But that's the, the technique. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. thank you. Um, the, so what we saw before was and, um, and at this point, I've kind of shifted back to the Pierce County numbers, but because uh, we're, we're given the accident rates and injury rates and percentages, but the number, and I assume those are connected to the um, pursuits, but the numbers dropped dramatically. So uh, looking more and dramatically at Pierce County, which covers a far, far bigger area, you know, we went from 644 to 90 um, so 35 percent of the 644 had accidents uh, which would be 200 uh, plus I'll, I'll look to, to Nathan yeah about 200 um, and accidents to what is that 27 percent of 90 30 accidents so we went from 200 accidents to 30 not all of those are injuries that could have again been whole variety of things, but even the injuries went from 12% to 10%, but 
more looking at the gross numbers, uh, we'll just call it 10 and 10, 10%, 10 64 people injured to nine people injured. Um, and I think that's part of the data that was being looked at, that, that side of it, uh, when some of this came into play. And acknowledgingly, I mean, I know you guys don't ever want to, you guys don't want to file the paperwork of an injury or if uh, there's something else being hit. Um, but we see those decreases, so part of what the intent is of the laws is apparently being achieved. But I'm also hearing unintended consequences. Uh, so knowing what you know after seeing what it was like before, seeing where we're at now, um, would you want to go back to exactly how it was before or modify, or are you in a position where you can really talk about what you would, knowing that there's bills out there in position, I also appreciate a few. Yeah, no, um, that's that's a good question. And that's something that we have always, you know, pursuits are really on that knife edge um, between risk to the public, but the need to apprehend. And so it's always that balancing act. Um, and so law enforcement has come, you know, a long ways in my career. When I started, we didn't have stop sticks, the spike strips, or they were fairly new at the time. Uh, now we have the pursuit interdiction technique and those types of things. So we're trying to reduce that risk by stopping the pursuits uh, sooner. Uh, my position is that this should be a local um, jurisdiction decision, and we have policy that already, before 1054, uh, we had internal department policies that restricted pursuits. Um, for instance, if it, if it was only a traffic infraction, that was not allowable pursuit, um, those kind of things. And then a lot of it is based on the, or the uh, parameters at the time. So the time of day, the traffic, the weather conditions, um, the ability to communicate, uh, those types of things. So uh, I think it's important to note, like for us, that you know a third of the time we self-terminate. So that means that the officers have actually started a pursuit and then terminate. It doesn't count ones where they don't even start the pursuit. Um, and there's been cases where, like, again, just for a traffic infraction, before the law, we would turn on the lights, they take off, you know, we wouldn't chase them uh, if, it was, if that was the only, only thing we had. Uh, we pulled our, uh, with our insurance uh, company through Washington City's uh, insurance, uh, 10-year liability loss report. And so since 2012, related to pursuits, uh, we've had only 14 claims. Uh, 12 of those resulted in no payment. One resulted in $787, and then there was one settlement for an uninvolved citizen that was injured for uh, well over $300,000. Um, so, again, there is a risk to the public uh, when we pursue, um, but, again, the flip side is that need to apprehend. And so I think there needs to be a better balance than where we're at right now uh, because criminals know that they have carte blanche to take off. So... Help me, if, if you may, help me understand that data. Uh, two claims paid out, but I'm seeing 40% accident rate on 66. Um, so, you know, 20 some accidents. Is it, are they going after the person who was fleeing, going after their insurance? I mean, there's a pursuit, my car gets hit, I'm getting hit, repaired by somebody. Right. And, and that's something that, yeah, I would have to dig back through uh, that data for. So I just have the back end. I just have what was claimed. Right. I don't have well, the connection with the accidents and, and how those were resolved. Okay. And obviously if they ran into a tree or something, that that might not have the same. Uh, and the accident rate, that includes if the fleeing suspect crashes. Right. So that's going to be written as an accident, even if they run into a Jersey barrier and Right, and and, I, and that may explain the uh, lower number of claims. If it's their own vehicle, then it's hard to make a claim against the city when it, they were the ones running. That hasn't always stopped them, has it? Probably not. Um, okay, uh, I think that that helps me wrap my head around a, a, a little bit. But you know, I obviously, you know, just looking at the data as it's up on the screen, we've seen some improvements in the accidents and injuries um fatality is such a small data point number that it that it, and and within your jurisdiction you're working in such a small data set that the you know your injury rate went up to 23 percent from nine percent but your number of pursuits cut in half so 
theoretically probably about the same injury rate. Actually, our number of pursuits dropped negligibly uh, because pre-1054, we were averaging about three a month, and then post-1054, uh, we're at two a month. Okay. I was looking at the other slide, which some of this may have been the old. Yeah, and the, the problem is the time period. I think uh, the pre-1054 was like 42 months, and then this is ah. only 14 months. So and again, a, you've got such a small data set that percentages can be right. wild. And, and we, you know, have that chart where, I mean, really the numbers of pursuits have not changed, but the eludes have, you know, gone through the roof, 30 or 40 a month. How were you tracking the eludes before, or were you? Uh, the same thing with the report and, and documenting that. Do you have the data on the eludes prior to? Yeah, it's in that chart. I would have to tabulate that. Mr. Chair, I believe it's in the original report. Okay. There's a chart of alludes over time okay. provided by Lakewood. Okay. So they, they, they were alluding, but it, and you've been more diligent in tracking it since. I assume there might have been times that officers were just, I don't know, I would never want to say an officer didn't fill out their paperwork. but Right, yeah. And, and that was a directive from the command staff that they document the alludes right. so. after the law. Okay. And then, uh, you know, the last thing I'll just add is, you know, the, the other piece to this is the um, tremendous increase in motor vehicle thefts. And so uh, correlation does not equal causation. I understand that. But I, I don't think you can ignore that. And I think that needs at least to be uh, studied a little bit further um, because, you know, we are seeing so many vehicles take off and a lot of them are stolen, uh, stolen vehicles. And so, you know, that's someone's ability to get to work and child care and all of that. Uh, it's not just a, a vehicle or a property crime. And I've been talking with people in other cities, and they're, they're, they're seeing this nationally. I can't say that our numbers aren't higher than the nation, but nationally there's been a large jump in. Um, the NICB, National Insurance Crime Bureau, uh, came out with 2022 numbers, and Washington was number three out of the country uh, in raw numbers. In raw so, numbers. So not... Uh, a ratio, but raw numbers. Which were about middle of the pack on population. So, Mr. Vedder. Sorry, Mr. Chair. I just realized I misspoke. We, we have the charts for Lakewood on stolen vehicles and vehicles without license plates, but not eludes. So that the elude data from prior to 1054 is not in there. Okay. So you're, you're, the, the time in which you engage the pursuit is still fairly... Uh, has remained fairly static. It's just they're just more people are just taking off before rather than just pulling over. Right. Okay. Uh, any other questions or comments from committee members? Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Right. Thank you very much for your time and taking time to come down, correct the data, provide the data, correct the data, uh, and have the conversation with us. We do yeah. appreciate it. Thank you. Very much appreciate it. Uh, gentlemen, anything else from from you guys to wrap this up, or? Uh, uh, sure. We can move on to the next. Okay. Phase. And so that would be back to what is number five on our. Uh, oh. Sorry, Mr. Chair. It would be uh, there's a few more charts to show. Oh, a few more charts unrelated to Lakewood. Okay. Yeah. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead, Nathan. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, so this is all about Pierce County Sheriff data, uh, and these were some requests from council members um, to kind of see uh, the data cut up slightly differently. Uh, so, um, uh, so this um, so this is uh, highest charge data. Uh, so taking um, all of the Pierce County Sheriff Department pursuits um, and looking at what the highest charge was here um, creates potentially a slightly different picture. Um, so we, I classified the offenses by the type of penalty. Um, this is obviously kind of somewhat abstract from the situation. Um, I did not, I did not include any eluding charges. That's a class C felony. Um, cause I was interested in what is the highest charge besides eluding. Um, and then if the arrest, had both a criminal arrest warrant and a class C felony, I, went, I included the warrant. Um, and then in case of, you know, where maybe you had two class B felonies, I went with the violent crime over a property crime. Um, to make this chart. Um, and I, um, I just wanted to include, uh, so next slide, please. 
Um, and one kind of note to make is that um, uh, possession of stolen property is, um, is often car theft. Um, theft of a motor vehicle um, requires like a pretty high level of probable cause uh, and like a connection. You have to have to see someone doing it. Uh, whereas like driving a stolen car is um, uh, that's, a, that's a possession charge. Um, you can find you can kind of argue your way out of it. Um, and want to thank Chief Wallen for making sure I made that point. Um, so what you see in terms of highest charges, um, let's see. So oh, and uh, I have some averages here. So the average. So this is these are uh, charges based on arrests from pursuits, um, and the average number of charges here is 3.77. Um, and um, kind of what emerges from the charts, the highest charges are often warrants, um, 83, uh, assaults, uh, driving under the influence, and then possession of stolen property. Um, and then this is followed by eludes. So this was a, these were cases where like the only charge here was elude, um, and then you have weapons charges, and then below that, traffic driving with suspended license. Um, this compa like compared to kind of uh, the other chart that just showed total charges, um, it had it had eludes at the top, then driving with suspended license, and then warrants, and then possession of stolen property. So a slightly different view of the data. So this is pre 1054, and then next slide, please. And then, so that this is post 1054, um, and then kind of one thing that comes out of the one thing that uh, has kind of come out of the uh, Pierce County Sheriff data is that uh, there's just a lot more DUIs um, because the bar, the evidentiary bar for chasing it, for pursuit is lower, uh, and also because there's just a lot more um, like you know getting into kind of something we'll be working on like traffic accidents, um, just a lot more kind of. Uh, uh, driving under the influence going on. So so the highest bar there is DUI? Yeah. Right. What's the raw number? Uh, it's 40. 40? And if we go back a, a one, what was the raw number on the DUI? Uh, it is uh, 38, but over four years. Uh, so there, there's more, there were more DUI, there were more DUI pursuits um, for the Pierce County Sheriff in the period from like when 1050 was enacted to now than there were before. So, um, so that was the so that, that was the highest charge um, chart. Any questions for anyone? Any That's other it. questions from anyone? Uh, committee member Hitchin. Thank you, Chair. Um, so going back to the first chart. When it says a criminal arrest, I'm assuming for an outstanding warrant, um, they they have already been charged with something and basically out of compliance with the rules. So before 1054, these were the people that would get pulled over. We would run their information, or we would run their information, realize that this person might be this person, and we pursue them, and then we would pick them up. And my understanding, of the, so, and then the second, so all the other ones are, you didn't have a warrant, but there was enough evidence to charge you with that when you got pulled over. Okay. So then we go after 1054 and we are not running people's plates, running information. Okay. So I think I'm tracking that data. Thank you. If, if I might. Uh, jump in here that I think the different what highest charge is showing is what ended up being that person's charged. highest charge and later in a minute um, Nathan will show the charge initiation uh, so between initiation and highest charge you kind of get a different picture of what's going on in pursuits as opposed to um, what all of the charge when you're pulled over there's probably a basket of charges some of one of which is the one that initiated the pursuit and in most cases, I would say, and then the other the other ones are the most serious offenses, the ones that we probably care about the most. So just different cuts at the same data. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, and uh, and thank you, Mr. Um, uh, yeah, you do get like oh, like if DUI is your highest charge, like they're they're often like three or four other charges. So there's usually an. I'm just in there I'm too. seeing if it's the same thing because it's kind of cut off. So there were 83 criminal arrests and then you go to the next chart and there's one yeah. okay for well uh, there are criminal arrest warrant arrests but they're 
they're, they're not the highest, the highest charge. charge. That makes sense. Okay. It's almost always, the DUI is almost always the highest charge yeah. and, and post in particular. Okay. Thank you. Uh, um, so uh, there's also um, uh, some desire to see why pursuits were initiated. Um, so uh, uh, I pulled them out for both pre and post 1054 from the sheriff's data. Um, so some, some brief definitions. Um, a traffic crime is a DUI, a driving with license suspended, um, a hit and run or a reckless driving. Um, felony property crimes are like stolen cars, burglary, or warrants. Uh, traffic infractions are kind of breaking traffic laws. Um, yeah, so then kind of usually what, usually sort of what happens there, and we can get into it a little bit more, um, is usually a traffic infraction happens, and then you'll check, like the, the highest chart, so not to confuse things too much, but um, usually what happens is like a traffic infraction will reveal a warrant or a, um, or a, like a driving license suspended, um, and then kind of risk danger posed to the public, um, this is kind of a, uh, like a deputy evaluation, the kind of continued operation of the motor vehicle will cause risk to the public. Uh, and usually the kind of highest charge there um, ends up being a DUI or a warrant as well. Um, and then felony person crime, uh, mostly assaults uh, and some weapons or robbery charges. Um, but obviously like a wide range of things, but just to give some examples. Next slide, please. So before 1054, um, kind of most initiations uh, are for traffic crimes of some variety, uh, and then kind of below that felony property crimes, and then infractions. Um, but usually these are kind of, uh, usually these are sort of connected to, uh, for traffic infractions, either connected to warrants or driving with license suspended. Um, and then for, uh, for traffic crimes, usually kind of reckless driving to UIs, license suspended, and then that's true. And so as you can see, it's somewhat of a similar story as the highest charge. Uh, since traffic crimes includes DUIs, um, that's kind of the, the bulk of things that's generated there. Um, so those are kind of updated charts for the council. Um, I was hoping to probably going to add them to the report as well. Okay. Hmm? Oh, and no, uh, and we're also working with the sheriff to um, uh, get a look at the geography of pursuits. Um, that was another question. To get what? I'm sorry. The geography of pursuits or make, a, make kind of a map of where all the pursuits started and finished. Um, there's Their crime analyst is currently out, so uh, we're kind of working through, working through the process with us. So. Okay. Any questions? Uh, community member Kruber. Thing. I'm, I'm wondering, could it, is it possible on these two charts that like the the um, after and the before, the blue and the red be next to each other instead of two different things to look at going back and forth. It might. Uh, yeah, some river, uh, or faster river. Um, yeah, I think we could probably do that. Okay. Um, I, just, I think the other, the other way to do it would be to annualize it so that we're not comparing four years of data to one year of data. Yeah. Uh, yeah. The average. That, that would help me. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Okay. Thank you. Uh, all right, carry on. Oh. Can I just, so to, to your point of four years of data to one year of data, if I don't have that in front of me, if I took the bottom numbers and multiplied it by four, that's really bad science, but like that would give me a ballpark. Okay. Thank you. Or divide the other one by four. Uh, dividing the harder. I'm a big fan of multiplying. <laughs> They're the same. I know. <laughs> Carry on. What, that was it? That, that was, was it. Okay. okay. Uh, all right. Well, then, thank you uh, very much. Uh, and just checking online for any questions. Uh, none, none online? Okay. Uh, thank you very much for that. Again, thank you very much for coming out and sharing with us and the continued yeah. work and engagement. All right, then we're going to come back to the proposed 2023 Performance Audit Work Committee Audit Committee Work Program. Thank you, Mr. Chair, members of the committee. Um, as you know, the committee is required to approve an annual work program. Uh, the attached or in your packet 2023 work program has been drafted based on discussion at the January 25th committee meeting, uh, and so. Just to go through, we, there was a discussion at that meeting, and, and through staff follow-up, we've 
added one proposed item to that work program, um, which was already fairly full um, based on the one that was set at the beginning of the last biennium. Um, in addition to road fund um, approach to domestic and sexual violence, which are ongoing right now, interlocal agreements, which you should have a proposed request for proposals at our next meeting. Um, uh, we've included one on traffic fatalities, um, reporting on the causes and impacts of traffic fatalities in the county. Uh, did you want to mention a few sure. things about that? Yeah. Um, thanks, so, um, uh, our, that's how uh, uh, our thoughts here kind of, um, you know, we've seen uh, as sort of the Vision Zero Action Plan and the Vision Zero Resolution are looking at, uh, we've seen kind of a rise in traffic fatalities and injuries um, in unincorporated Pierce County. Um, and our thoughts with the study, we're going to try and provide a complement to the work of the Vision Zero Action Plan. Um, we're looking at kind of what are the main causes of accidents, what kind of factors contribute to accidents, and the geogra geographic distribution. Um, and then also kind of what differentiates accidents from fatalities, and also how do we compare to other uh, counties in Washington State, um, as well as comparing both counties and jurisdictions to kind of get at um, what, are some, what are some of the potential causes there. Uh, and we have a pretty decent data set to work from. Uh, WashDOT has all of this data and has already given it to us. Uh, and um, there's some other kind of, we're, we're going to look to some comparative county data and all of there's actually like just volumes of liter like academic literature on this to kind of go through uh, and work, work on work for methods. So. Uh, how current is the data? Uh, it's th I think it's like through the end of last year. Through the end of last yeah. year? Yeah. I okay. think, I, I haven't actually looked, but I think, um, I think it, I, it might even be like year to date. So. Okay. I just, sometimes I get frustrated, like, we've done this analysis and it's through 2016. And it's right. like, okay, that's not helping. <laughs> you know, so yeah, through the end of last year would be fairly current. Thank you. Um, and uh, the rest of these items we have discussed at the previous meeting, uh, looking at uh, accessible services and homelessness, uh, behavioral health workforce, which the council has just received a, a large presentation on. Uh, we're going to work to see if there's any complementary work we can do with that. Uh, we discussed the COVID response a little bit farther out. Um, and going on to the next page, the, obviously we'll be working on the behavioral health tax program evaluation. Um, one thing I believe was added yesterday was the housing tax program evaluation. Uh, we'll be exploring how to best do that. Uh, this year, um, and uh, a housing dashboard. Uh, do you want to say a couple of things about that? Yes. Um, so, uh, so I had some good conversations with uh, Jason Gauthier at Shape um, about how useful this would be, uh, and they're they're committed at Shape. They're kind of uh, doing affordable housing. They're recording all the affordable housing in Pierce County um, as the projects come online. Um, so, the the utility, I think, for us is to look at uh, production, like where housing is being produced and like what units and this this kind of work. Um, so that's something they're not doing. Um, uh, evictions data is also kind of a thing that they will not hit at. Uh, and then also uh, home ownership is a home ownership. And then I should say uh, Airbnb as well, or short-term rentals, I believe, is the more correct thing. Uh, so I think... Uh, uh, we should be able, like, yeah, with, uh, it's like kind of been working through what the data availability is here, um, but I think, and, and I think in two months we'll present something more fleshed out, um, but I think we have kind of a bunch of different goals, and have, I've had some good leads on data sets for, um, uh, for short-term rentals and for, uh, like, just rent in general. Uh, there's a UW professor who has, like, all, has, been scraping online rental listings for like 20 years. Uh, so I will be potentially able to uh, provide like a lot of different data about the housing market that isn't readily available. So that's sort of where we're going with it. Um, and uh, yeah. Excellent. Yeah. Any uh, questions from committee members? Go ahead. Um, just something to think about would be supportive housing. Um, we've we've increased the number of supportive housing units. Um, we have 
now two hotels have been bought by government agencies and then being functioned or being run by um, Lehigh, I believe. Um, but we also have senior assisted living, people with dementia. Um, we, have, we have group homes. Um, we just have a lot. And so just really kind of understanding that because we're, we're seeing a need. And I really keep coming back to senior housing because the projections for our county by 2030 is, you know, 25% plus of our county will be above the age 60. And we have a lot of single family homes that are not built for aging in place. So I think having an inventory of where we are so we can look at, especially if it's geography, like where do we have supportive housing for um, aging seniors that, that need to find places because we have this investment possibility in front of us now and I think that's one of the things that we need to keep an eye on so if somebody wanted to be able to age in their community but we have done no building or no supportive housing for for seniors or seniors with dementia or adults with dementia in general um, it would be good to know because I think that's going to be a need in our county as we get older other things I think we could look at and I don't know how trackable it is is, is student housing mm -hmm. Uh, particularly as um, you know, we've already got significant student housing around UPS and PLU, but UW, uh, Tacoma, I think, starting to get some TCCs working on some. You know, when we look at affordable housing, it's the three S's that primarily use it, seniors, soldiers, and students. And so I, I don't know how much we have the ability to track, you know, how many of our JBLM are in, in of a lot of our housing. We heard that definite testimony yesterday um, of uh, how right now there are any soldiers that are uh, stationed here have a hard time finding housing. And one of the needs for affordable housing is to have a place where they're, I mean, you know, a place for them to live so they're not having to live several miles from, or several hours from base or not hours, but, you know, a long distance from base, which really begins to affect our overall military readiness. Um, but the, uh, so yeah, the students, soldiers, if we can somewhere figure that out, and, and again, if you can't parse it out, that's okay. And the other is, you talk about short-term rentals, wondering if we can also track number of hotel rooms mm -hmm. over the same time, hotel motel rooms, because I think we've, We've seen something interesting happen where motels began to see a drop in occupancies because of the rise of short-term rentals because I'm going to stay at a house instead of a hotel. So they begin to drop. Now we see hotels being turned into housing mm -hmm. because they weren't really making enough money as a rental because they lost it all to the houses that were renting out. And so now they're turning those into long-term housing. To, to kind of, I don't know if there's any way to track what's happened because I know on the Hosmer, I think four or five hotels have recently, while well, they weren't government bought, they were private bought and turned into housing. So if there's a way to, as we look at the rise of Airbnb, what that's done to number of hotel rooms. So I, I don't know how to track all that, yeah. but uh, just something to kind of put out there and Thank you, Chair. I'm just curious, can anyone help me understand why more housing is not built on base? It seems like they have a lot of land. Community member Hitchin. Thank you, Chair. We've been having an ongoing conversation about this with the uh, South Sound uh, Military Partnership uh, Group. Um, there is um, the Department of Defense works with a private contractor or a private agency to build on base, and there were some concerns about where we could locate them. There, uh, Congresswoman Strickland has facilitated a, uh, agreement with the Department of Defense to um, go in and actually clean up and fix our current housing so that it's up to code and, and usable and we can expand, and she continues to advocate for changing, working with and building more on base. There is a group, uh, a, a subset of that group that I'm part of that is specifically looking at that because we have service members that are deploying. We heard this last night, but I'd heard this before. They are deploying while their partner and two-year-old son is living in a hotel in a comfort inn. 
for months. And I don't know about you, but a two-year-old in a hotel room sounds pretty miserable. Um, Long term. On a vacation, sure. But (laughs) every day, all day. Um, And, you know, and and so there's just, there's concerns. So it is an ongoing conversation, but it, it has to do with how they contract and facilitate because it is a base. There are certain things they have to do. So they're very concerned about building housing on a military base and there are certain things that they need in place. But if you've been on base recently, it's like driving into a city. Um, Mm -hmm. So I don't quite understand. And I've asked that question because you can, Mm -hmm. you know, there's the Quiznos, there's the Domino's, there's the Children's Museum, there's the three empty lot type spices. The commissaries, the which commissaries are basically there. Why, why can't I? Why can't I put housing there? And there, there hasn't been really good answers. So some are way farther up the food chain than than and any of us, or even Congresswoman and Strickland is. They are working on it, but it's. And there's been lobbying by interest groups, um, primarily uh, rental housing associations, realtors, and builders, because if it's built on base, they don't get to sell it. They don't get to rent it. It's all base managed. And so if we can not allow them to build on base, then we can get a cut of that market share. So it's been blocked by, uh, and I don't know so much here locally, but in other communities, uh, the private sector won't let them build on base because they want the profits. So you mentioned units that needed to be updated. Do you know about how many, like 10 or Um, 100? I could look and see if I have that number. I don't remember how many it was but so, I might have it in an email. So they're like sitting empty? No, I think they're in use. They, in, in some cases, I just don't think they're at capacity because some were deemed uninhabitable, meaning there was like maybe mold or um, electrical needed to be updated, things like that. But it wasn't like tons of them. And it, a lot of it was single family home and then um, kind of multifamily, like duplexes and fourplexes. I, it's not the barracks. It's the more the family units just kind of fell out of disrepair. Okay, interesting. Thank you. And as we're casually talking, as you talk with these groups, I think what would be really interesting is if, flip over to the other side of the base, off Pacific Avenue, if they could take the first few hundred yards off of uh, State Highway 7 and put some base housing there that feeds on to Pacific Avenue. I mean, it, it seems odd to have a high-capacity corridor with a grass field next to it or that the first few hundred yards could be apartments. That's all for military housing um, or even just sell it off to the private market and allow it to um, build up and, and be for housing. But I'm trying to figure out if you're talking about an area that's part of our crash zone or whatever the name is for that, where there's a certain Down area. by the Roy Y. Oh, okay. You went that direction. Okay. Because you, you, you have that long stretch of, oh, look, it's the military base. Well, I thought that's when, where the inland group was going. Well, that, I mean, that could be, but I think that might be one. But, I mean, okay. it, it maybe it is. Maybe I'm missing that. But I drive along that whole stretch. I'm like, that's the military base, and it's beautiful trees, but you're on a corridor, and there's services here. It seems that we'd want to build into our corridor. But I just pass that along to as general conversation. Did we confuse you enough? (laughs) Look at all the things. All the things. And then more. So uh, the work program is required to be adopted by the committee. So if it's acceptable to the committee, uh, a motion to accept. As uh, Mr. Smith, go ahead. I move to to accept the uh, work committee uh, or the work plan as uh, presented by Mr. Vetter today. I have a second. All right. It's been properly moved and seconded. Any other discussion? All those in favor, say aye. 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 Any, aye. Opposed? Any opposed? All right. It is adopted. Uh, annual report. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, we could move in the presentation to the 2022 annual report. Um, the committee is required by charter to report quote, annually to the public on the highlights of performance audits conducted that year. Uh, So I've put a draft for you, for the committee to review. Um, Can quickly go through, uh, next slide. Uh, We've 
put synopses of each of the projects that were completed in 2022 along with uh, committee members, including the homeless services assessment, the, the evaluation of boards and commissions. Next slide, please. Um, the vehicle pursuits report and the ferry comparative analysis. Um, next slide. And then some of the proposed studies for 2023, 2024. I wanted to thank Brian Dominique for helping to put this together uh, for the committee. Um, so uh, it's something that the committee can review uh, before the next meeting or if it looks okay uh, to move to accept it. Uh, if, and I can answer any questions as well. It's, it's basic, same format as, as last year. So we've been using the same format for a couple of years. So. Any questions or changes? Motion. Go ahead. I move to accept the 2022 annual report as presented. Second. Okay, it's been properly moved and seconded. Uh, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries. And number seven, performance audit committee reporting plan. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, staff was asked to prepare a communications plan to better inform the county council on the work of the committee. Um, the charter directs that each audit must be presented in an evening public meeting within 90 days of completion. And this has typically been accomplished by, as an agenda item during a council and district meeting, which are in the evening. Uh, these are often brief presentations appropriate for a general audience, but otherwise there's no other formal channels for the council to receive reports from the committee outside of committee meetings. Uh, so um, one thing that we've done in the past uh, was to produce a meeting preview newsletter, e-newsletter. Uh, you can, uh, next slide please, um, that shows the highlights of the next meeting. Uh, this is something that council member, and this would go to interest party, interested parties list. Council members can share with their constituents uh, so people have a heads up of, of what's coming at the next meeting. And um, we can also include agenda items and, and to the council weekly meeting schedule uh, so that if something comes up when those are um, presented at study sessions, the council can know about them and, and further ask about them. And then at the last, the last time the um, a performance audit was presented in an evening meeting. It was after a council meeting. Uh, so uh, it seemed to work better in terms of having the council there and having time to present it and take questions. Uh, so that's something we can continue to do in the future or, or discuss other ways to, to uh, have an evening meeting. But that seemed to be the most effective. Yeah, I think... I mean, given that we had a 90-day window and there were no in-district scheduled, I mean, last night you could have had both an evening and a late-night uh, <laughs> presentation. So, uh, the uh, no, we're glad you weren't presenting one last night. That would have made a longer meeting longer. Um, but uh, uh, any other thoughts or ideas on Council Member Hitchin? Thank you, Chair. Um, I. I think it's really important that we continue to, to hold to making this accessible. Um, I found it convenient. There are sometimes topics that make sense at in districts and there's other times where it's there and it just seems like you're checking a box. Mm -hmm. And I feel like if we're gonna check a box, doing it from here makes more sense than a, <clears throat> an in district where it just doesn't fit. Um, and, and so, um, I really appreciated that. I think the question becomes, you know, making sure that we're not pushed up to a clock where, where we, we're not noticing. And, and I, we noticed, we did everything we're supposed to, but really being intentional about this work, I think it's important that we invite people to engage. Um, so kind of thinking about like the, um, the behavioral health one that we're going to do in this overview of all that it could go in an in district, but I think all of the council is very interested and, in, and it might be important to invite stakeholders, people that are actually engaged in those services. And that might be easier to do here after a council meeting than at an in district meeting. It just seems to kind of not fit sometimes in our in districts. So I kind of liked that. It seemed a little bit cleaner, I guess. But that's just my thoughts. Thank you, Member Kruber. Thank you, Chair. Are you um, 
going back to I believe we had the five o'clock meeting. So it's five o'clock the, the the when the clock starts for an evening meeting. That's what was determined. Yes. So like we did before, where it was a five o'clock meeting, and we did that. That's I I tend to agree. It's not something I want it in in my in district meeting. Well, I think you know we'll take these a little bit case by case, but. Once we review it, we've got that 90 days, see what in districts may or may not be coming up, whether or not the subject matter fits anything. If not, then start checking the council schedule, because again, last night only had three items on the agenda, but it would have been a bad night to have one scheduled. So um, making sure we also don't want one where if we have a afternoon meeting, that's gonna be a 30 minute meeting, and then have to come back at five. So. Not the worst thing. I'd rather do that than, <laughs> but uh, try to make sure it's one where uh, it's just a nice break between two meetings. Okay, staff will proceed along those lines. All right. Uh, other business? Is there any other business today? Any other business from members? All right. Well, with no further business before the committee, we are adjourned. Thank you, everyone.